I'd like to talk about why and how God will get people to move. So the menu of options that he'll employ here are going to include what he's always used for this. That is violence, uh, famine, and disease. So violence you can subdivide into civil unrest and war. And as far as famine, we need to inject some modernity into that. So anciently, famine was an economic measure. It, it, it was tied together. The food supply and the money supply were much tightly, much more tightly coupled than they are today. Today, because of, I don't want to call them technological advancements, but because of mon modern monetary systems, we'll say, those, um, those create a, a, an additional width and depth in the economic category. And so you could have things like widespread unemployment without necessarily having mass starvation. So those are the tools, civil unrest, war, economic problems, availability of food, and disease. So to hear this, you might react by saying something like, isn't God's purpose for people to have joy? Why would he employ suffering as a tool to increase that? Well, this dovetails into the question of why does he want people to move in the first place? But let's start with joy. You have to realize that joy doesn't exist in a vacuum. It comes from value. It comes from value. And while you don't possess what has value, you're limited in the joy that you have. And when you don't yet realize what has value or how much it has, you are limited in the joy that you have. So maybe you've never considered it, but um, two of the factors of how much joy you encounter are definitely where you are and who you're with. In fact, where you are matters for a bunch of reasons, but maybe the most important reason where you are matters is because of who you're with. Your location relative to others and your disposition relative to others, it absolutely impacts your joy. How? Well, among other things in two ways, the appraisal and receipt of value through those that have both of them. What do I mean by that? People who have what is valuable and people who know that what they have is valuable. And then another piece of this is how well you can transmit those if you're one of these people to others. That is a huge component of joy. So obtaining what has value, learning that it has value, and then knowing how to share it with others and doing so effectively, it absolutely impacts the amount of joy that you have. And the importance of what I'm saying right now, it, it, it far exceeds the number of words I'm using to say it. This is absolutely a preview of much bigger and more important points that then can be made in a short video. And so I will be writing a lot about this. I have written a lot about this, but I'll be publishing a lot about this later on. But for now, feel free to replay parts of this video to try to better understand snippets of what I'm saying. Anyway, God uses tools to move people to where he wants them to be especially when they're, they're, the places he wants them to be are places that seem less favorable. Now, they only seem less favorable because we lack understanding or the people who see them as le less favorable. When God sees them as favorable, those who see them as less favorable, it's because of a lack of understanding. And a huge chunk of that is that our interpretation of what has value is largely dependent on present circumstances. So what's needed here is a better understanding of the future, a better understanding of how things really are. And absent that, it's very difficult to help people understand 
that value is different than what they think it is. And until they understand that, they will be very limited in the joy that they can experience. We're, we're, we're exiting a time of mercy where temporal prosperity has been poured out on the just and the unjust alike. Now, there seems to be a lot of wealth disparity and in, in absolute terms, there is. But relative to historic times, everyone, at least in the first world, world countries, everyone is living in tremendous temporal prosperity. That includes those who do what it takes to deserve it and those who do not. So of those two groups, who do you think appreciates it more, given what I've said so far? So increasingly, that prosperity is being unjustly removed from and even prevented in the first place from the righteous, the ones who deserve it. And I'm not saying rich people are righteous. Prosperity is much more than just wealth. But overall well-being, to justly receive it, you have to be righteous. It's not just as, as the simplicity of, oh, I did things that earn money. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay? It's bigger than that. But increasingly, what's happening is in order to preserve the flow of unmerited prosperity to the unjust, the just are being sacrificed, and it's happening left and right. Cancel culture is a piece of that, for example, just so that you can see what I'm saying. Ever-increasing minimum wage is an example of that. Laws that prevent shoplifters from being prosecuted is an example of that. All of these things drastically decrease the flow of blessings to those who deserve them in order to flow them to those who do not, to preserve the flow of them to those who do not. When general prosperity is removed from the righteous, God intervenes and he imposes his justice. God's justice abases the wicked and exalts the righteous. As God abases the wicked, more of the temporal prosperity people enjoy but do not deserve will be taken away. As God exalts the righteous, more of the temporal prosperity they have been denied will be poured out upon them. As God reconciles the world to his standard, he makes much plainer the value of what is valuable and the lack thereof in everything else. This provides a blessing to all as they are more clearly shown how to orient themselves to the greatest value that lies beyond what they already have. In the past, people would say things like, I'm going to move to a place that's better for me, or I'm going to move to a place for a better job. Well, increasingly, they're going to be saying things like, I'm going to move to a place where there is someone better than me. Or I'm going to move to a place where I can survive. I'm going to move to a place where there is food to eat. I'm going to move to a place where I'm safe from the people trying to kill me. Now, obviously, these shifts, they span a very wide set of possibilities and time frames. But the point is that the opportunities that are presently upon us are closing. The unmerited prosperity that has flowed out to us for so long is turning off. Babylon will fall and it will hit everyone on its way down. As we proceed through the end, you are going to find all things becoming polemic. Everything is, is currently mixed up, but everything will move out to the extremes. To, to good or to evil, to valuable and not valuable, to beautiful and ugly, to true and false, to useful and not useful, and so on. One of the, the dichotomies among all of this will be where you live. Almost everyone in the United States lives in almost the same mix of urban and, and suburban dwellings today. But most of the land in the United States is vacant. 
There are 96 people per square mile in the USA on average, but suburbs have about 4,000 people per square mile, and cities have about 10,000. So that's, it's, it's highly concentrated in the cities and suburbs. More people are going to move to places that reduce the median people per square mile. But at the same time, the cost of doing so will continue to rise. It will get to the point that people can only move to rural areas by taking what they can carry on their backs. That is going to happen. And they will consider it worthwhile to do so. That's an important point. Of course, you don't right now. That's what I'm trying to say. That's going to change. There's still time to move to rural areas with far less cost and far greater benefit. The cost to stay in rural areas will continue to skyrocket. This is one of the reasons we will see changes in the structure of government from the county level up. There have been talks, you've probably have heard some of the conversation about splitting states. It's, it's an ongoing thing in several states, and it's gaining traction. Whether or not that happens in particular locations, I'm telling you, you're going to see county splitting too. And this is at least including the legal processes for doing so. There are laws defined that allow this to happen. And you'll see this happen more and more as city spending becomes untenable for those living in the country. The, the cities will continue to spend more and more, and eventually there will be more and more people in the counties saying, no, we're not going to do this. We can't afford this, and we're not willing to lose our houses because our property tax keeps going up so much. Furthermore, and this is a part of it, you're going to see the cost of commuting continue to rise. And so even with work from home, work from home doesn't work for everyone. There are many jobs where, where that, that just isn't an option. And if you live in a rural area and you can't afford to live in a rural area, something's got to change. But just the cost of commuting for whatever purpose, including work, is going to continue to rise and the resupply of rural areas will continue to get more expensive and so it's going to be this multifaceted change that that in in aggregate it's it's going to create much more difficult situations and since the policies that are enacted by society by governments and also just culturally are always based on the supermajority of people and since those people live in cities and suburbs you're going to see that they don't care they don't care if they outlaw internal combustion engines it, and that's one possibility right they don't care if property tax can't be paid by rural people because the inflation is localized to city jobs they don't care if most of the new jobs are government jobs and those are all in the city as, as private sector employees fall further and further behind in the, their ability to make money and, and, and stay with inflation. They don't care. However the particulars work out, there are many, many options. We will reach a point where those who live in rural areas will march closer and closer to one of two extremes. One is they're independently wealthy because only the very wealthy will be able to afford to just keep cutting checks to balance out all those conditions as they change. Or they will be desperately poor. And the desperately poor people are going to be eating what they grow on their own property with their own hands. This is not the same as what most people think of when they think of growing your own food which is some mix of yuppie farmers markets and some kind of LARPing co-op, which all of that requires massive amounts of fossil fuels and massive amounts of modern money. 
electricity and all kinds of supplies that you presently buy in town. All of those things are in danger. It might not be too much of a stretch to claim that the time is approaching where you will have to choose whether you want to be broke and free or broke and a slave. Those may be the only two options. Now, if it gets to that, there will be a brief moment where slavery seems to be the only path where you can hold on to some remnant of your present quality of life. We saw during COVID that this is quite a siren song for people to deny. When faced with a choice that them or one that's comfortable, most people will form a line at the booth that says comfortable. But that's a temporary illusion. And as some people have learned the hard way with COVID, whatever seemed comfortable always turns to dust when it comes at the cost of what was right. Everything that fuels that illusion also guarantees that it will quickly evaporate and be replaced by something far worse than the original alternative. But usually by then, it's too late, like we learned with COVID. So as these changes come, people will be compelled to move to and prevented from moving away from the cities. What possibilities exist? Here are some. One, their homes and businesses will become very difficult to sell, except at unacceptable and increasing loss. Some people that lived around the riots a few years ago, the Antifa riots, saw this happen with their businesses and or homes. All of the sudden, no one would buy them for anything close to what they owed on them or what they were worth. Two, exit taxes. Now, if you've been paying attention, you'll see that this isn't some contrived idea. There are already governments who are talking about exit taxes I've seen this discussed at the federal level in California, and I believe New York now. Vehicle mandates. Washington and California are racing for who's going to outlaw the internal combustion engine first. Guess what happens if you live in a state where you can no longer drive an internal combustion engine? Well, if you live in a rural area, you're in trouble. Not only that, if you had any hope of selling your property, you're in trouble because now you can't. And so how are you going to move except by walking away or taking an enormous loss? What about fuel shortages? Now, there are so many places around the country that for which it's, 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 or to which it's difficult to deliver fuel. And if it's not cheap, it's not gonna come because, and, and I'm talking about cities I live not too far outside of Missoula, Montana. Look at a map. There are so many cities around the country that are in the middle of nowhere. And as costs increase, it just won't be justifiable to ship things out to those cities anymore. What about violence? I mentioned the riots a couple of years ago. You're going to see things like that again and again. And sometimes they're going to be much worse. Then you've got the cost of housing, whether it's rent, which could, could skyrocket overnight for a variety of reasons, but it is continuing to go up regularly. You've got home sale prices, you've got property insurance, you've got property tax. So uh, I know of many cases, at least in Florida and California, where popular insurance agencies suddenly stopped covering homes. And so anyone with a mortgage had to choose from one of the remaining options. And in one specific case I know about, it's someone I know, their property tax suddenly went up by 20% when that happened. And I think they got off easy. What else? Well, the stores, services, and goods that you rely upon will become harder and harder to obtain. They'll become intermittent and unavailable, sometimes permanently. Many of us have experienced certain stores closing down and not coming back, like I told you would happen before COVID happened, and then it did happen. 
They will become more and more reliant upon the government to provide them with the needs of life because these changes are going to make people unable to obtain them in the old ways. Cities don't provide, they don't have the ability to grow food for themselves. And so where is it going to come from? If, if it gets cut off and it's not available in the old free market ways, the government will have to step in and provide it in some way. There are always strings attached. Now, lest you say that this is some extreme or far off thing, I invite you to open your eyes because there has been an exodus ongoing from many places around the country. I grew up in Baltimore. Guess what? No one lives there anymore. Why? Detroit, same story. Chicago, getting there. New York City, I saw an article recently that 50% of people in New York City are planning to move in the next five years. Well, I hope that they make that next year and not five years from now because the market's going to plummet. If everyone's getting out, it's a one-way street. That's not too good for property prices. Washington State, California, Oregon, all of these people are experiencing an exodus of, of folks, businesses, and people. Now, like so many other things, this situation is one of many where the wise path is a knife's edge, and it's difficult to walk on. On the one hand, most of you are just not willing to do what you have every reason to believe is appropriate. You need to begin to take what others will regard as extreme steps towards moving towards the places you want to be when everything falls apart. Because by the time it's obvious, it will be too late. On the other hand, some of you are a little too excited about these things happening and you have some kind of grand romantic illusions about it that make you prone to do far more than what makes sense. I'd say that there are fewer of you than the first category. I'd say almost everyone is in the bucket where they won't do what they have every reason to believe is appropriate. And the reason is just because other people aren't doing it yet. So my invitation is simple. Do what is reasonably justified. Do your own research. Get the facts for yourself. Weigh them out. Look at what your options are. Look at the cost benefit for each of them. Pay attention to the probabilities of these things happening. There's nothing wrong with being different. If you want to be better, you have to be different. But being different doesn't make you better. Not necessarily. Don't be different because you're less reasonable than normal people. Be different because you have greater faith, because you are more reconciled to reason, and because you have more or better information.